On the 3rd of December, panzers of the Abteilung arrived by rail, unloaded at Balatonkaneza, and were driven at once to Simontornia, where the Abteilung command post was located on the estate of an Hungarian noble. I got to know the baron, a fine-looking elderly Hungarian gentleman. He invited the Abteilung officers to dinner, and it became an unforgettable evening for me. Our host and the baroness received us in evening dress. The table was laid with fine porcelain and glasses, flowers and candles. A footman with white gloves served drinks, then the lady of the house invited us to the table. I cannot remember the sequence of plates. After the hors d'oeuvre, the baron made a speech which moved us all, and we drank a toast to the old German-Hungarian brotherhood in arms. Our conversation was deliberately cultured, and I remember that in conclusion there was a wonderful cake, similar to our Himmelstorter at home. Just as we're about to be served coffee, there exploded in our very animated circle like a lightning bolt from the heavens, the report by our reconnaissance platoon. The Russians had appeared nearby. I hurried out, alerted my panzers, and sent out my lookouts. To be surprised by the Russians now would be extremely unfavourable. The commanding officer sent the reconnaissance platoon to make inquiries. I came back and drank my coffee. The Abteilung HQ was making hurried preparations to move out and went that same night. I remained with my battle group at the village for the time being. Our host was determined to get his family to safety. Fromm offered him Abteilung vehicles and urged him and his wife not to remain here under any circumstances. The estate vehicles were loaded up and after the first confusion, everything seemed to proceed with careful deliberation. My assignment was now to secure the area for the time being and maintain contact with 23 Panzer Division, for apart from my Panzers, there were no forces available to oppose the Russians. At daybreak, I could see the next village about 1,500 metres away from the windows of my command post. The Russians had got that far in the meantime. In the course of the morning, there was some exchange of fire. Russian tanks had ventured out of the village, probably on reconnaissance. Upon receiving our fire, they made smoke and fell back. Towards midday, I was told to move my battle group during the course of the evening. About the same time, I noticed that in the courtyard, the estate vehicles, which had been loaded the previous night, were now being unloaded again. I went to find the baron, who declared that to flee made no sense, he would not leave his estate. His two teenage sons would make their way on horseback to relatives in Vienna with money and provisions. Shortly after that, I saw them ride off. I offered the baron three of my armoured personnel carriers to take his family to safety. He was indecisive, and I increased the pressure on him to go. I could sense what a difficult inner struggle he was having. It was a dramatic and, for me, a deeply moving situation. In the end, he decided to stay. He had the illusion of hiding out at a hunting lodge in his woods, until after the first days of the Russian occupation were over. Now I could delay my departure no longer. My panzers had returned from lookout duty and picked me up after I took my leave of the baron and his wife in the cellars of their mansion. He gave me his calling card and I wrote my home address on the back of it so that we could keep in touch after everything was over. I never discovered what happened to him or whether his two sons ever reached Vienna. It was a sadness for me that I was unable to help him, but I could not fight the war on my own. We embraced and I left. I reported with my panzers to the commanding officer 15 km away at his provisional command post, a very large manor house whose owners had fled leaving only an aged servant to protect it. He opened up to us very reluctantly. In this sumptuous, internally quite modern house, I was impressed by the gorgeous bathroom and built-in bar near the drawing room. Unfortunately, the bar was dry. The heating was still working, there was hot water and I took a glorious bath. What luxury and what happiness at feeling clean again. I used a British soap on a rope but forgot to take it with me when I left. I would willingly have stayed much longer in these quarters. After the servant had brought us tea and biscuits, we moved out at four o'clock and I drove the commanding officer direct to one panzer division, to which we were now subordinated once again. I moved into Lepsony with my battle group, Next morning the alarm was raised, and I had to take my Tigers without delay to 2 Infraget 1 Panzer Division, whose command post lay 5km from Syafok. 
The main front line there consisted only of strong points. The Russians attacked constantly, hoping for a decisive breakthrough at Stuhlweissenberg. I divided my battle group. Half had to advance along the highway towards Siafok, where the Russians had gained ground yesterday. Lieutenant Kopper led this part of the battle group. In order to relieve the infantry, the other half was to attack a village from where the Russians were making raids on our lines. I led this second group myself. I left my medium-wave radio vehicle behind at two Infragets command post as a relay centre. It was not always easy in the unfavourable circumstances to operate a properly functioning signals network. I drove with my panzers to the position ordered, the infantry company sector. I did not like the route there in the least. In parts, it was bottomless mud and difficult for my panzers to pass. The infantry company consisted of 21 men guarding two kilometres of front, therefore the length of a football pitch each. They were overjoyed when we arrived and now felt safe. We launched the attack against the enemy-held village immediately. It confronted the infantry company sector from about 2 km away. The attack went well and although we were only three panzers, this was enough. We knocked out six anti-tank guns, at which the Russians decamped, and I pulled back to position the Tigers between the infantry trenches. The infantry were content. I established contact with Lieutenant Kopper and his half of the battle group. The attack had not gone so well there. An Oberfeldwebel from two company had been killed. We were really depressed about it. I went on foot to the battalion command post, where I had ordered my tracked motorcycle to be brought, and drove from there to the regimental command post to discuss the situation with the regimental commander, after which I was given orders to move out at 18 o'clock. I had had the feeling all day that something was going to go wrong. We often had these presentiments of disaster, and mostly they came true. Since there was only an hour to go until we moved back, there was no point in my going forward again, and instead I passed the order by radio to both halves of my battle group. While I was at Regimental HQ, my three panzers were commanded by Feldwebel Seidel, a reliable veteran. Both halves were to come now to the regimental command post. The infantry was to pull out at 21 o'clock to form a new line some kilometres further back. I expected my panzers any time after 18.30. Then a radio message came from Lieutenant Copper. While moving out, two tigers had stuck fast in a swampy meadow just short of the highway. Recovery work was underway. I was on tenterhooks, for the place where Copper now found himself was on the main front line, about 100 metres from the advanced Russian outposts. There was no infantry available for close protection. Thus we were faced with a difficult recovery. After about 30 minutes came a new message. During the recovery work, a third tiger had got stuck fast. As if that were not enough, Feldwebel Seidel radioed me that two of his three panzers had bogged down on the path in the quagmire. I closed to despair. Five panzers all bogged down together was bound to end in disaster. After a jittery half hour, Seidel reported that his two panzers had got free. When they arrived, I went with them to the spot where Lieutenant Copper's three panzers were stuck. Previously, I had received the regimental commander's promise that the infantry would remain in position for as long as it took to get these panzers free. When I reached Copper, I found the following to be the situation. 20-30 metres to the right of the Seafock Highway, three tigers had sunk fairly hopelessly into the morass. In the darkness, the path was very difficult to see, and the panzers had turned off only a few metres short of the highway. Every time the Russians heard an engine, they fired off wildly in its general direction, and the bullets whistled all around us, which naturally made the recovery work much more difficult. Before starting up an engine, everybody had to take cover, for the Russians were shooting with everything they had. Artillery at quite short range, mortars, anti-tank guns, MGs, you name it. They were zeroed in on the highway and firing blindly along it, while we had to keep on the firm ground of the highway in order to carry out the salvage work. Finally, after much effort, we got one panzer free and on the highway. Suddenly a barrage of fire. I took cover behind the panzer, a deafening explosion, an impact on the highway very close to me. I was struck in the face and felt something warm running down my nose. A shell splinter had cut me. How easily it could have put my eye out. I thought of my presentiment and felt relieved that now it had happened 
and I was freed from the nightmare of premonition. But there was worse to come. It was past midnight on the 8th of December, 1944, and our situation was touch and go. We had no German troops to the right or left of us, and no close protection. I wanted to make one last try and got two panzers into position on the highway to heave. All available hawsers were joined together to reach the two casualties sunk into the mire 30 metres away, and the hawsers were just long enough. When everything was ready, the order was given for all men to take cover in the panzers, and then the engines were started up at an order given by radio. The Russians opened fire again, raking the highway. It was really very dangerous. Nevertheless, we got one panzer free, at which I was very relieved and elated. After things had quietened down a little, I opened the turret hatch, intending to sit up and supervise the recovery of the other panzer. At that moment, I received from the rear a blow to my right shoulder, and my right arm hung down limply. This time I had been hit badly, a through and through to the upper arm, bleeding heavily. I had received the wound from the rear, therefore the Russians must have worked their way around behind us. I gave Leutnant Copper instructions, and when a dispatch rider came by to inquire how much longer the recovery work would go on for, I went back with him and had a doctor dress the wound. I had been very lucky in that it was a pure flesh wound, the bones were intact. An hour later, I was at the Abteilung command post. Shortly afterwards, Leutnant Copper also came by, as careworn as I, to report that the last panzer could not be retrieved, because the Russians had surrounded the site and had worked their way up to the towing panzers. The last bogged-down tiger had to be shot into flames, but I was happy, however, that of the five which had stuck fast we had got four free. For a long while this had seemed impossible to me. Next morning I was examined by the Abteilung surgeon, result, admission to a military hospital. I was still thinking about whether I wanted to go or not, when the alarming report came in at ten o'clock that the Russians were on the point of occupying Polgardi. The command post packed up everything in the greatest haste, and a short while later we were on the way to Stuhlweissenberg. I reported myself unfit for duty to the Abteilung commanding officer, and went to the Tross at Barna. There I worked through all my outstanding paperwork, such as promotions and recommendations for decorations. Feldwebel Bornshear had fallen, a painful loss for the company. I had to write to his wife. Next morning I drove to the military hospital at Komarom, taking with me Gefreiter Bola, whose wound was still causing him problems. We spent only one night at Komarom. Next morning we were listed for a hospital train. This did not suit me since I wanted to remain in reach of my company. Therefore I drove back to the Tross at Barna, and from there next morning by car to Vienna. I took Bola with me, and also my driver Glasel and Oberfeldwebel Grohmann. We had three punctures on the way, and on the outskirts of Vienna a long delay for an air raid. I went first to see Leutnant Ferlinger, who was being treated as walking wounded and staying with his mother in Vienna. He took me next day to a military hospital where Bola and I received excellent treatment. I could move about freely with my arm in a sling and enjoyed the days in Vienna. I went several times to Hitzing to visit my godmother Irene Adensama, who was very worried about the future. When the Russians occupied Vienna in mid-April 1945, she and Uncle Sander committed suicide. On the 20th of December, Bola and I were discharged from hospital at our own request. We wanted to spend Christmas with the company. I had ordered my vehicle to come to Vienna to pick us up, and on the 21st of December we drove back. Our wounds were not yet fully healed, but we ignored it. My tross now had quarters not far from Varpalotta. Very pleasant quarters had been prepared for me there in the rectory. Next morning I drove to the Abteilung command post at Berhida to report back for duty. Hauptmann Fromm had meanwhile been transferred out to the Panzer School to lecture in tactics and had already left the company. His successor was Hauptmann von Diest Kerber. As I presented myself to him with the words, Leutnant von Rosen obediently reporting back, he interrupted me and said that I had made a false statement. I had been promoted to Oberleutnant on the 1st of November 1944. Immediately after that, he left with the Panzers for operations towards Polgardi, and after speaking to my Panzer crews, I returned to the Tross to save my energies for a few more days before mounting a tiger again. 
On my return, I found field posts from my parents awaiting me. They had evacuated to the Blunkwets at Rottenfels. On the 24th of November, Strasbourg had fallen to the Allies, and since then, Rastatt was on the front line. What it must be like there, I could imagine only too well. At Christmas, the company surprised me with a tree and presents. Amongst other things, our company shoemaker, a Russian volunteer auxiliary from Mius, had made me an attaché case from pieces of leather scraps, a touching gift, and I have it still. The Spies, Hauptfeldwebel Müller, had slaughtered four fat pigs at the tross and hung 500 sausages in a smokehouse. On every subsequent transfer, we transported these sausages and the livestock maintained by the company to the new base. Müller, a baker and confectioner in civilian life, had also baked Christmas biscuits for the whole company, various sorts, with and without chocolate, with nuts or filling, almost like Café Moritz in Rastatt in peacetime. Thus, every man of the company got a paper bag with biscuits and three sausages. I wanted to spend the evening with my panzer crews. A lot of thought went into it, but the situation thwarted our plans. The previous night, the Abteilung had had to move to Fehervatsurgo. The Russians had unleashed a strong attack and succeeded in investing Stuhlweissenburg on Christmas Eve. Our panzers had been in the thick of it. In the evening, I arrived at the Abteilung command post, bringing the commanding officer a present from the company, and then I celebrated Christmas with the repair group. I was not able to go forward to my panzers, and that night the company lost another, Lieutenant Rambo having had to destroy his tiger after putting seven enemy tanks out of action shortly before. To be deprived of any King Tiger was a sad loss. I was on the road until two o'clock trying to deliver presents from the company personally, and announced some promotions, amongst them the promotion to Feldwebel of our magnificent Unterofficier Gartner, wearer of the German cross in gold. I stayed with my tross until the 31st of December 1944. On various occasions I went along the road towards the front, but more importantly I had time for my wounds to heal. I did present myself once to the commanding officer requesting that he allow me to remount my panzer, but I was directed back to Tross. However, on the evening of the 31st of December, orders came at last to take command of my battle group again. The front had receded somewhat and my panzers were at Moor, famous for its good wines and numerous taverns. The Abteilung was now subordinated to four cavalry brigade commanded by General Holster. It had two mounted regiments, yes, even in 1945 the Wehrmacht still had them, and a so-called heavy Abteilung with some Panzer III's and armoured personnel carriers. The commanding officer was Rittmeister, cavalry captain, Graf Plettenberg, to whom I was directly responsible. He was also to be found at Moor with his HQ, New Year's Eve at Moor was far from restful, for the Russians, whose trench system was in the wine-growing hills at the end of the village, were able to look down and see everything going on in our nest. Apart from short pauses when they drew breath, we lay under almost incessant Stalin organ or mortar fire. The worst time was just before midnight, when the shack in which I had set up my command post rattled and shook dangerously. My men preferred to spend the night in the panzer. With Lieutenant Rambo and a couple of other company stalwarts, we celebrated in the shack with a couple of bottles. At midnight, I dashed to Graf Plettenberg's command post and we drank to the new year. I radioed a poem to Abteilung, and thus 1945 began for us. I thought often of my family from whom I had not recently received news. At that time I got personnel reinforcements. Lieutenant Rubble, coming fresh to us from officer training, was made leader of the Thre platoon in my company. This post had been vacant since Lieutenant Wagner had been wounded. Before the officer course, Rubble had spent two years in one company and had had an outstanding instructor in Oberfeldwebel Fendersack. It had been his aspiration, therefore, to return to one company. I got on very well with him, but he had the feeling that he was not welcome in three company. I have to say that I saw no such signs, but was happy to have such a capable and experienced man with me. We remain friends to this day. The new year began with an early morning alarm. The Russians were putting very heavy pressure on the grenadiers in the vineyards, and we set out with elements of the brigade for a relief attack against the heavily reinforced Hill 128 north of Moor. 
We made a quite good impression on the cavalrymen with this attack. Rittmeister Graf Plettenberg's heavy Abteilung and the writer Rogt von Mackensen were to attack from the southeast and we King Tigers from the south, the two groups meeting up at the objective. On the approach, my Tigers became lost. In the snow, one hill looked much like another. Where was this damned height 128? There, a heavy enemy force on a ridge. Without regard to what might be to my left or right, I attacked the ridge. The Russians fled, leaving all their guns and equipment behind. We had found Hill 128, and therefore the Tigers had arrived where ordered, on time, and suffered no losses. When Cavalry Brigade arrived, we had everything under control. An entire mounted cavalry regiment attacking was an improbable sight. My cooperation with Rittmeister Graf Plettenberg was extremely enjoyable. His heavy Abteilung was an extraordinary association. The officer corps was homogenous, cultured in manner, gesture and speech. Though in action it was very weakly armed and armoured compared to us, it was at least extremely mobile. I enjoyed the distinction of being an outsider fully accepted into their circle. We carried out successful attacks together. The brilliant night attack on Archie Puster comes to mind particularly. After a 10 kilometers advance through the woods of the Vertes Mountains, we surprised the Russians so totally near Archie Puster that this enemy-occupied town virtually fell back into our hands. I recalled my night attack at Jongyos. Yes, if I had had such support then, perhaps it might have succeeded. Between our various operations, I was often with Graf Plettenberg. I remember especially an officer's evening, with roasted pigeon. In his circle, the conversation was very free and frank. I learned the background and details of the 20th of July plot, previously unknown to me. I had never before experienced such open talk and unequivocal rejection of our regime, particularly the Nazi party and everything connected with it. It was not just criticism, but open opposition. I felt that I belonged within this circle. Plettenberg was a splendid officer, as was his adjutant Graf Obendorf. That I had been fully accepted into this circle, considered as one of them, and had taken part in these dangerous conversations touched me deeply, and in many respects gave me release. That evening, Graf Plettenberg tried to convince me to transfer into his Abteilung to lead a new company of panthers which was being formed. It was very tempting for me to remain in this attractive, aristocratic world, but it would mean leaving my own men in the lurch, who had absolute confidence in me. My decision was clear. I had to remain with my company and Abteilung, where I had good and fine comrades too, and who had gone through hell with me. My detachment to the heavy Abteilung was terminated, and heavy Zapt 503, which meanwhile had almost 20 King Tigers operational, was led into the fray by the commanding officer, while we remained with Graf Plettenberg temporarily for cooperation. A major offensive was being planned for the near future to prevent the threatened occupation of Budapest. We moved back to Fehervatsurgo, and some very difficult days of operations followed. Difficult because the enemy was tenacious and the terrain dreadful. A few days previously there had been heavy snow, but now there was a thaw and the mud took over. The terrain was monotonous, vast undulating plains with now and again a manor house raised to the ground. To orientate oneself in this bleak region was difficult, especially at night, and we had to move mostly by night. I experienced many unpleasant night journeys at the head of my column, although ultimately we always arrived where we had been heading. Our orders were to capture Zamali. The town lay well protected in a gully. The attack was difficult, the Russians dogged. We roared frontally into an anti-tank gun front and were taken under heavy fire from ahead and from the flanks. Feldwebel Gartner's panzer received a lateral through and through. Apparently we were facing Stalin tanks. Gartner was seriously wounded and died on the way to the main dressing station. He had a dreadful wound in the thigh and bled to death. Another terrible loss. Later the attack was abandoned. We pulled fairly well back and spent an awfully wet and cold night in the panzer. We were hungry, frozen and dog-tired. All the many strains to which we were subjected defy description. The panic, the false alarms, bad news about panzers breaking down or bogging down, or the Russians suddenly breaking through. This all played on the nerves. In the end, one didn't have nerves anymore and surprised oneself by what one still had the power to do. 
One thing was clear, the big attack across a broad front did not have the hoped-for success on the first day, the Russians being very much more tenacious than we had expected. The next day, the 8th of January 1945, it could be felt that the Russians still had the initiative. Orders and counter-orders followed one after another. We were ordered to La Jamajor, but scarcely had we arrived than we were told to go back to Bobaya Major. When we got to Bobaya Major, the order came to return at once to La Jamajor, where 60 enemy tanks had turned up. Apart from some artillery and mortar fire, all was quiet there. Next morning there came an alarm and we had to proceed to Alsapusta. Here we destroyed seven enemy tanks. A violent blizzard raged. That night, too, we spent in the panzer. It was cold, so we had to use the soldering lamp to warm up, and we all got black faces. The attack on Zamoli was resumed on the 11th of January. There had been a thaw with much slush. We rolled out at six o'clock, and the advance was scheduled for 6.40 after a brief preparation. Our Abteilung had committed 13 Tigers for the operation. After rocket fire, we engaged an anti-tank gun position frontally, my company being on the left flank. First, we had to cross the Stuhlweissenberg Zamoli Highway, where the Russians were dug in and determined. Now we had to make a 90-degree turn with my left flank unprotected. Although they had 10 to 12 guns in position to my left, the enemy ran for it when we attacked. We continued, and then our panzer received a heavy blow as I discovered later a through and through in the engine compartment. I got into another panzer. Panzers of my company were now receiving heavy hits. Together with other panzers of the Abteilung, as ordered, we reached a hill from where we could operate effectively against Zamoli. At the same time, Graf Plettenberg had just led his heavy Abteilung into Zamoli. Here he was seriously wounded and lost a leg, and his adjutant Graf Obendorf was killed. From this hill, Feldwebel Sachs destroyed three Russian liaison aircraft attempting to take off from a meadow near Zamoli. I dismounted to inspect the damage which my panzer had suffered, then went to the commanding officer's panzer which was not far from me. On the way I captured some terrified Russians who had been feigning death in their trench. We had no more time to waste and got going again. The breach had to be widened. We knocked out a number of anti-tank guns and then came to a sloping vineyard beyond which it was not possible to see, but apparently fell away steeply. This blocked our advance, and we took up widely scattered security positions. We warded off two raids by ground attack aircraft after being bombed, but the Russians had very skillfully positioned some Su-152 self-propelled assault guns in the vineyard. These were dangerous for us, since they could penetrate our frontal armour with their 152mm howitzers. We had not even spotted them when suddenly a one-company panzer went up in flames, killing three men, the two survivors suffering serious burns. Half an hour later, the same happened to a second panzer. We withdrew a little. Apparently, the crews of these guns observed us from hiding. When they saw a panzer, they came into the open, aimed and fired one round, and withdrew into cover immediately. This deprived us of the opportunity to return fire and knock them out. In this terrain, without cover, we could find no reverse slope. We had to hold our hill at all costs and secure it, because only in that way could flank protection for Zamoli be effected. Despite small changes of position, a few metres forwards, then back, a little to the left, then to the right, it was unavoidable that the Tigers stood around in the terrain, offering a large target. After another half hour, a third panzer, standing to my left, was hit, killing some of the crew. We were at a loss how to deal with these assault guns, since we had no idea where they were. It seemed to me that my panzer would be next because the Russians were shooting systematically at one panzer after another left to right. I kept a sharp and concentrated lookout. Just keep calm, I told myself. But it was a ghastly situation. It was approaching dusk. How I longed for nightfall. Then I saw a powerful stream of fire from opposite and at once we were hit. We were whirled about and suddenly daylight could be seen from within the panzer. We had received a through and through, the engine had had it. I shouted, abandon, and in five seconds the whole crew was out. Thank God they all made it. Only the driver had been wounded. After taking him along the path to the dressing station, I returned to the panzers. Darkness was falling, protecting us from further losses. 
I still had two panzers intact. I went on foot to the commanding officer's panzer for a short situation conference, then crept my way back with a crew member carrying a submachine gun. The panzer had not caught fire, and we had orders to bring it back. We made it ready to tow. That is to say, the engine and drivetrain were disconnected in the interior by removing a number of screws. Then the towing hawser was attached. Meanwhile, I stood guard with the submachine gun. This was more for moral support than effective defence. Once darkness fell, a one-company panzer towed the casualty away under the Russians' noses. Now I saw how lucky we had been again. A large area of armour had been penetrated, yet we had only one man wounded. Of the thirteen panzers which had set out that morning from Abtelung, by evening we had three still operational. One company had seven dead, while three company just one man wounded. Two panzers were write-offs, the remaining tigers, some of which had received serious damage, could be recovered and brought to the rear. In one of these towing manoeuvres, Lieutenant Hirlein, the Abteilung adjutant, was wounded. The day had brought the Abteilung heavy losses as against the success of reconquering Zamoli. Losses inflicted on the enemy were 21 tanks and self-propelled assault guns, 20 anti-tank guns, three aircraft and a multiple rocket launcher destroyed. We headed back to Alsopusta. Next morning I drove with the commanding officer to the Abteilung command post at Bodai. There I received my appointment as company commander. Until then I had only been company leader. The appointment was only made possible by my promotion to Oberleutnant. It did nothing to change my duties, but after a definite time as commander, one could be promoted to Hauptmann. To that extent this appointment was an important event. Now I had a couple of days to rest. The Abteilung surgeon attended to my wound, not yet fully healed, and I attended to my company's panzers, ensuring that they emerged as quickly as possible from the workshop. The next few weeks we operated in the fehervatsurgo zamoli stulweissenberg triangle, the purpose being to protect the narrows between Lake Balaton and Lake Velenser, mostly by attacking the enemy where they broke through. Stulweissenberg changed hands several times. On the 10th of February, Budapest capitulated. The two attempts to relieve Budapest made either side of Lake Valencer got very close to the Hungarian capital, but in the end our forces were not strong enough. We had good results, destroying numerous Russian tanks, assault guns and anti-tank guns. Our losses were kept within acceptable limits, and in this period the company had no fatalities. If the number of Tigers operational was large, the Abteilung would be led by the commanding officer, and the three companies by their respective commanders. If the number fell, they would be assembled into a battle group led by one of the three company commanders. The leadership changed every seven days, so that if everything went according to plan, after seven days of operations I would have a rest. Of course it did not always work out that way, and then I would have to spend longer in the field. The panzer crews often got periods for rest, as nearly all panzers went into the workshop from time to time, to repair battle damage or technical defects. Then they would remain with the panzer. The general war situation was by now causing us great concern. I had in my company some Silesians and East Prussians who had serious worries for their families once the Russians had crossed the Reich borders in the east. Some got news that their families had been evacuated. Others had received no field post for weeks. This uncertainty was intolerable. I knew the family circumstances of my men. They came to me with their problems, but in these cases my hands were tied. Married men always got preference when it came to handing out leave passes. If happy or sad tidings were received from home, there was always special leave no matter how the situation stood with us. It now happened much more frequently that soldiers had to be given leave if news came that their family had been bombed out. When these soldiers returned to the company, one had to take a special interest in them. The more tragic the circumstances became in the homeland, the more the company became a constant factor, a kind of substitute family for the men. Here one felt understood and supported by their comrades. What they told us about the homeland was generally not good. The war had taken over all aspects of life. The loudest mouths were those who had never experienced the front, and so one would be happy to be back at home with the gang. I also had concerns. I had heard nothing from home for several weeks, 
but I knew that my parents were at Rotenfels. But what was it really like? What had become of my brother Vula after the bombing of Dresden, of which we had naturally heard? Thus every man had his cross to bear. On orders of the highest, the Abteilung was renamed Heavy Psaptfeldherrenhalle, and we were integrated at the same time into Panzerkorps Feldherrenhalle. We thought this was nonsense. We preferred to be 503, and within the unit continued to refer to ourselves as such. 503 was now a Waffen-SS Heavy Psapt, and so, around the 5th of February 1945, it was rumoured that we were to be pulled from the front, to where was unknown for the time being. On the 12th of February, the Tigers began loading at Moor, and we arrived at Panzerkorps Feldherrnhalle, which was preparing to play the leading role in destroying the Russian bridgehead on the Gran. Here our Abteilung was subordinated to Reichsgrenadier Division Hoch und Deutschmeister. The first transports arrived on the 15th of February at Perbete, and the Abteilung set up at CSUZ. Because insufficient rail transporters were available, three company had to wait until empty wagons came back from Perbete to Moor. Therefore my company did not load until later. I used the time at Moor to try its wonderful wines. We made visits to the wine growers, and were soon able to distinguish the better wines of the southern slopes from the others. The Russians had established a major bridgehead over the Gran, a tributary of the Danube, which presented a constant threat to the German front and Vienna. In order to remove it, a force was assembled consisting of our Panzerkorps, a Waffen-SS Panzerkorps, and the Leibstandart Adolf Hitler. The attack was to begin on the 17th of February 1945. The Abteilung had 22 battle-worthy Tigers, but only a few from three company. The attack began well, but then the commanding officer's panzer received a hit on the side of the turret, because Hauptmann von Diestkerber was forced to navigate from an open hatch at night, as did all panzer commanders. He was seriously wounded in the back of the head by a shell splinter. Lieutenant Heerlein took over leading the attack, and the commanding officer was taken by an armoured personnel carrier ambulance to the rear and was treated later in the Luftwaffe hospital at Pressburg, Bratislava. Hauptmann Wiegand, chief of the supply company and the oldest company leader in the Abteilung, came forward to take command. I did not take part in this attack because most of three company had not arrived at Perbet in time. Now, on the morning of the 18th of February, they were ready and could get involved in the Abteilung's attack. At daybreak, we advanced along the railway line to Kisnifalu as an Abteilung. After three hours, the village was in our possession once we had broken through strong anti-tank gun and tank fronts. The artillery gave us outstanding support. I had their advanced spotter as sixth man in my panzer. Therefore, I could tell him directly what I wanted, and he then passed it on to his batteries as a radio message. The artillery laid smoke into the village, forcing the Russians to decamp. Their defence had begun to totter. After mopping up, we pushed on and were soon confronted by a minefield. In order not to lose time, I dismounted and cleared a path myself for the panzers, and diffused wooden chest and tar mines, as I had been taught in 1943 at Tolokonoye by the pioneer Oberfeldwebel Baumann. In half an hour I had diffused fifty mines, and then we passed through without damage. We reached our first intermediate objective and came across only weak resistance. Meanwhile, we had progressed a good distance behind the Russian lines. A new order now came from division. After decoding it, we thought initially there had been some mistake and requested a repeat. But no, we had a new objective to aim for about 20 km from where we were now, and it was getting dark. Therefore, we advanced, always cross country, occasionally running into enemy tanks. Open fire, hit, press on. The most difficult task was to navigate through a pitch-dark night. Towards midnight we came to a very swampy area which caused us difficulties. Some distance away we saw to our left white flares going up, the signal for German troops, and we heard the typical engine noise of German panzers. After another hour we succeeded in making direct contact with the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, which had made its way here from the north with 40 to 50 panzers. At first we approached them, but then received an order from division to halt. This was in the Musler area. Hauptmann Wiegand went to establish contact with division, 
while I waited with the panzers for several hours for our supply, which arrived at four o'clock with the longed-for field kitchen. The food was cold, only the coffee was hot. Towards seven o'clock, I arrived at Kobolkut as ordered with the panzers. Here, Hauptmann Wiegand was waiting for us with new orders. We had to liberate two villages, but apparently the Russians had got wind of the presence of tigers and decamped, and we fulfilled the mission without meeting significant resistance. Here we would have liked to pause a while, but new orders kept us going. This time our advance took us through mountainous country. It was a strain, particularly for the drivers who had had no sleep for 28 hours. The pre-spring sunshine made up for it somewhat. Towards evening we got to our new objective, much longed for, but we had to make a night attack on Caimend straight away, therefore no sleep. The terrain before us was difficult, numerous deep gulches had to be crossed, and in darkness when contact with the enemy had to be expected at any moment, making it doubly unpleasant. We had already driven through the Russian lines. They had been abandoned, which gave me an uneasy feeling. After crossing a very difficult gorge, we came to a broad, elevated plain with an upward slope. We could only guess our direction of advance. Therefore, we went forward slowly. It was clear to me that our main difficulties would not present themselves until daybreak. If we reached Kemen during the night, we would be left totally to our own devices after dawn, for the entire area could be easily seen from the higher ground on the other bank of the Gran, where the Russians had positioned themselves. We would not be able to receive supplies or reinforcements during daylight. This was something to worry about later, for our advance was still progressing and the Russians were too quiet for comfort. Suddenly we came across mines laid to the left, right and ahead of us. We were already into a minefield whose borders could not be determined. We began attempts to clear them, but they had been laid carefully and were totally frozen in besides. There was no room to manoeuvre, and we finally had to accept that we had come to a dead end. We worked feverishly to change the damaged sections of track, this setting off other mines in the process. Since we could not proceed through the minefield, our only option was to withdraw, for now it had begun to get light. The calendar read the 20th of February 1945, my last day on active service. We had just pulled back to the gorge when at first light we had the Russians at our throats. Their tank attack was skillful, but in tank combat we were still a little superior to them. Towards midday the situation quietened down and Hauptmann Wiegand drove back to the command post. I left two panzers on watch ahead and went back two kilometres up to a quarry in order to give the crews some rest. Every two hours the two panzers ahead were to be relieved. I stretched myself out on the rear of my panzer, enjoying the warmth of the engine below and the sun above, and fell asleep. A little later the enemy artillery fired on precisely this little spot and shell splinters shattered my left elbow. I noticed this while half asleep and did not fully come to my senses until I found a surgeon working on my arm. He applied an emergency dressing and I was conveyed by armoured personnel carrier to the command post at Kobolkut, where Dr. Bury looked at the wound. They were all very concerned about me. Lieutenant Copper now took over command of the company, and I discussed everything with him which needed to be done. They had given me a shot of morphine, and this held off the pain. I reported myself unfit for duty to Hauptmann Wiegand, and drove to the workshop where I had my evening meal with Oberleutnant Barkhausen. Then I was returned to the tross at Tardoskt, in the more comfortable Mercedes of the commanding officer. We arrived there around midnight, expected by the species, Hauptfeldwebel Müller. Thanks to the morphine, I slept well. Next morning, in the orderly room, I dictated some important things I wanted to see to myself, promotions, decorations and the like, then summoned the company Feldwebels to take my leave of them. The company was fallen in, lest those men on active duty forward, in order for me to make a parting speech, short because I had begun to feel weak and my dressing was soaked with blood. In closing, I told my company what I firmly believed at that moment. In three months, I shall be back with you. Then I shook each man by the hand and was driven in the commanding officer's car to the Luftwaffe Hospital at Pressburg. Hauptmann von Eichel Streiber accompanied me to Pressburg. My commanding officer, Hauptmann von Diestkerber, was also at the Luftwaffe hospital there and I was admitted to his ward. 
Not much could be done with me the first few days. Because of the large wound and swelling, it could not be put in plaster. The wound was treated twice under anaesthetic so that splinters of shell and bone could be removed. There was much discharge matter. I was given daily injections of morphine and was always asking for more, but the dosage could not be exceeded to avoid my becoming addicted. After a few days, the commanding officer was discharged at his own request. I had been able to dictate my letters to him, and he helped me so far as necessary. The letters in which I informed my parents of my wound never arrived. The last field post they received from me was dated the 17th of February 1945. The French had occupied my home province of Baden before my letters from hospital arrived. I became very bedridden. The doctors were at a loss, for without a plaster cast the bones would not knit, and because the joint was shattered the ends of the upper and lower arms could not unite. The arm remained badly swollen and suppurating. There was often talk of amputation, but the doctors there did not want to risk doing it. As soon as I was able to travel, they would send me to a hospital in Germany. At that time, my company had a pause in operations, and so from time to time a vehicle would arrive with visitors. One afternoon at the end of February, I received a surprise visit from Hauptmann Eichel Streiber, wearing a solemn face, followed by Spies Müller and Feldwebel Sachs and the hospital surgeons. On behalf of the commanding officer, Eichel awarded me the German cross in gold. Müller had brought a lot of drink and cakes he had baked personally and acorn coffee in thermos flasks. More and more people joined our happy throng, and we all drank a toast to me so often that I needed no painkillers for the rest of the day. I received humorous cards from the company signed by everybody, and a very kind letter from the commanding officer, which pleased me greatly. They remain of great value to me today. In the evening I was visited by the German envoy in Pressburg, Minister Hans Ludin, who had held the test for my essay writing certificate in 1939. In 1941, he had become an essay Obergruppenführer in the diplomatic service and was hanged as a war criminal at Bratislava in 1947. He stood at my bedside and congratulated me, then read my name on the clipboard at the foot of my bed and asked, A son of the old Rosens of Rastatt? When I confirmed it, he recalled how during his fortress confinement at Rastatt, he had been invited to lunch at our house on many Sundays. Next day, he sent a young female secretary from the consulate with two bottles of champagne. A few days later, I was scheduled to be transferred by hospital train to Germany. Fortune smiled on me again. In mid-March, the Army Group consultant surgeon, a professor at Greifswald University, came on a routine visit to the hospital. He was available to all military hospitals in the Army Group's area, in order to advise on difficult cases, and if necessary take them on himself. He had been shown four such cases at Pressburg. After examining me he operated at once, and so saved my stiffened arm. Now he fixed my arm at a 190 degree bend, using a chest, upper and lower arm plaster cast, which kept the wound area open, and by hooks reaching into the wounds fixed the bones in this position. This gave them the chance to knit together again. At the end of March, the Russians were dangerously close to Pressburg. I was brought out on the last hospital train to leave the town, and after crossing the Reich border on Easter Sunday, went into a military hospital at Gars on the River Inn on the 3rd of April 1945, and transferred three days later to the military hospital at Haag Inn because better surgical treatment was available there. The well-known Professor Frey of Munich was chief surgeon, and so I was in the best hands. I had lost weight over the preceding weeks, and my plaster cast had begun to rub, therefore windows were cut into it for access to the suppurating wounds. Naturally, I followed the course of events from the various fronts. In April, a large town or city fell every day. It was entirely obvious that the end was near, and not even a miracle could stave off our total defeat. On the 20th of April, the Führer's birthday, Goebbels made a speech of praise which ended, as did all those made over the years, with the sentence, May he remain for us what he is to us, and always was, our Hitler. I remembered this phrase very clearly, because in seventh grade at high school, I had had to deliver Goebbels' birthday speech from memory. At the time we thought it was rubbish, 
but upon hearing these words again on the 20th of April 1945 in this situation, I could only shake my head and marvel at how people had been taken in by it for all those years. On the 1st of May, the special bulletin came reporting Hitler's death, kept back from us for 12 hours, and that he had reportedly fallen in the battle for the Reich capital. Finally, I thought, finally it's over, and we can put an end to this pointless butchery. Make it quick, for better an end with horror than horror without end. Some days previously my plaster cast had been cut off. It was a long procedure before I was finally peeled out of my breastplate. The bones had knitted together, but the wound looked much as before. Now that the cast was off, I could carry my arm in a sling. The wrist was stiff and the shoulder far from flexible. I dressed myself for the first time and took a walk through the village, but was happier when back in the hospital. Every day the improvement continued. Only the elbow required a heavy dressing because it was still ejecting small splinters of bone, which was good, 